Um, well, thank you for the wait. Um, my name is Michael Walker. Um, I'm doing a talk on code generation. Uh, so I, uh, let me go ahead and get into it. Uh, about me, I'm from Youngstown, Boardman, uh, Ohio. Um, some of you don't recognize anyone from here, from there right now, but uh, I went to Youngstown State, got a computer science degree with math minor, um, now currently attending Vanderbilt University, and if you didn't know, YSU is one of the few schools that has a penguin as a mascot, so it will kick your butt, just like Paul from earlier. Uh, so I, I work at the Institute for Software Integrated Systems. It's a, a research institute at Vanderbilt University. Um, the, it, here's some of the blurbs off of the website. But basically it does both basic and applied research in um, systems as a whole. So uh, uh, software integrated systems are both uh, physical and software systems that are integrated, which is obvious from the name. But uh, so real-time embedded systems, things like that, uh, um, like that. So um, I will discuss my project um, here in a bit. But uh, so uh, the beginning of the slide, I think it's on the book and whatnot, it says model integrated computing. So uh, model integrated computing is kind of a uh, weird way of development, but I think it's awesome, to be honest. Um, they kind of uh, spearheaded it at Vanderbilt, actually. So what it is is, here's blurbs about it, but so mathematical models as the basis for your development, but you integrate those models all throughout your development. So when I say mathematical, I just mean something with a math basis. So there's lots and lots of ways you can do it. So. Um, finite state automata, uh, flow charts, anything that has some type of mathematical rigor to it, you can use. And uh, so that's what uh, all this is about. So OMG, um, some of you might have heard of, and things like that, um, actually putting it to practice. The using models, and I'll show you a simple model here in a bit, but actually using models in your development to make your development life uh, easier because once you mathematically, I don't want to say mathematically, but it really is. Once you mathematically prove that that works or something should work, you don't have to touch it anymore. So you know that this should work. And if it's not working, it's your implementation. You fix your code generator, you fix your s interpreter or whatever, and you get that to work. And so you can redo multiple things of that type quickly. And you know that next iteration will just work. So uh, here's my outline, uh, sort of, short one. Uh, how and why mobile applications are different than normal applications. Um, some of you, actually, quick raise of hands. How many people are developers? OK, that side of the room, apparently. Uh, and uh, when I say developers, how many are mobile or something along those lines? Two, OK. So this might be interesting. You might, some of you might or might not know there's differences when you're developing mobile applications, different requirements, things like that. And so I'm going to discuss that. Uh, the AMO project, which is the project I'm working on. It's a DARPA project. And the Druid code generator is what uh, I've been working on personally. So mobile devices. Um, current device landscape. Um, a little bit about Android, um, AMO, and Druid. Not really sure why those are in those twice, but yeah. So uh, why mobile? Uh, mobile devices are going to become the most common devices, specifically in third world countries uh, and or Africa, South America, um, parts of Asia. Uh, everybody has a, a cell phone, but they don't have anything else. So uh, huge demand. Um, here's some. <laughs> blurbs and statistics. Uh, Android uh, is, in particular, the most common mobile device operating system. So um, that's why I'm targeting it. And the project I'm working on uses it. And China, uh, China in particular, is just ridiculous when it comes to how many uh, devices they'll have and how many are powered by Android. 
So here's uh, some main differences between mobile and PC. Um, some of these are common, and some of these you might not think about. So battery and bandwidth, everybody realizes, because none of our cell phones, uh, none of our smartphones at least, last more than a day, maybe two. And uh, uh, so screen size, memory, GPU, CPU, whatnot. But uh, the last one can be interrupted. So you might not have ever thought about this, but you're playing your Angry Birds or you're uh, doing something, and a phone call comes in. Well, your application has to instantly die or go into hibernation, and the phone call has to come in. Because that phone call is the most important thing. That's the real point of your phone. Uh, another uh, example of that would be something along the lines of an uh, emergency alert system. So you're playing Angry Birds or whatever, and, oh, there's a tornado uh, half a mile away from me. Maybe I need to know about that. So that's one of the things the emergency alert system is actually looking into implementing. And uh, so uh, one of the di very difficult things with making mobile applications is localization. Um, here's uh, just a little bit about where, I think this is growth? Oh, uh, traffic, where the traffic is coming from on mobile browsing worldwide. And so localization isn't just translation. So in um, Japan in particular, uh, in the US we normally put the OK and cancel. The OK is on the right hand side. They actually flip it. So if you flip it, they might not realize and hit cancel instead of OK without them really reading it quickly. So when you uh, localize to Japanese, you actually have to flip the buttons um, to make it more con consistent with what they're used to. It's a human factors type of concept. And I'll get to why I'm mentioning that later, uh, why I bring this up. But uh, so uh, if you're picking mobile, you have to pick all these options. Um, you have a bunch of decisions to make. What programming language are you going to use? What tools? Who, who are you going to have to sacrifice like lambs to to make money, maybe, or at least develop? If you choose Android, you have a bunch of uh, API levels to target. So uh, what version of Android are you going to target? Um, and my recommendation is to love the support library. You can do everything from 4.0 er, and up, the newest versions of Android, all the way back to 1.6. So what was literally on the T-Mobile G1 or HTC Dream or whatever it was called. Uh, so literally the first phone can still run the same code and have the same features as your new products, mostly. There's a couple exceptions. But you just uh, load it in a static support library instead of having it built into the operating system. Pretty nice in my opinion. So and, uh, you've chosen Android. Now what? Uh, so as an example, I'm going to bring up the Ammo project that I'm working on. Um, and how does, uh, well, Ammo is funky because it's a middleware, not an application. So it has completely different everything compared to what normal people have to worry about. And so uh, let me go ahead and tell you about this. Uh, what I'm talking, what all I'm saying is public knowledge about Ammo. It is a DARPA project, uh, Def Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. Yes, I got that right. Um, so currently, uh, 2,000 troops overseas have Android devices that are running Ammo and Ammo applica Ammoized applica applications, and they are using them to. Uh, there's a full list, but uh, there, Ammo allows you to do a lot of things, and so th whatever the applications they have, so. Um, IFF, identify friend or foe, uh, navigate back. So your even bad GPS that's on handheld devices like any of these on the table will have fairly accurate GPS to, oh, I'm in this section of the mountain. Okay, well, I need to go there. We thought we were way over there. And so you could envision easily a, a group of troops that were in a dog... Uh, a, a battle or something, and they got turned around, they didn't know where they're at. Yeah, it, the normal means they would be able to figure where they're at. But 
in this case, they have, oh, I'm right here without any huge major military GPS equipment they have to carry, things like that. So it miniaturizes and simplifies their ability to identify where they're at. And plus, uh, um, because it's an Android device, you can make an application that says, oh, I found a ton of weapons caches here or I found a village that we didn't know about here. And they can mark it on their application and then come back to base. They can show, this is where I was at. Here's the GPS location type of thing, whatever the case could be. And uh, in particular, this is actually be really good for emergency response. So in Boston, uh, if people were following um, the recent bomb expl explosions and whatnot, uh, all the cell phone networks were dead. So if you had a web application uh, that allowed EMS to enter information and uh, basically record what they're doing, triage to alert the hospitals of what's coming in, it wouldn't work because all of that the cell phone network was basically dead because everybody was using it at once. But a situation like Ammo, they make the report, and when network availability comes online, it will send the data. So even if they're just pulled up um, to the hospital, wirelessly connects. And so they instantly, the hospital will have that information. So lots of scenarios like that. Uh, so that's the point of ammo. Um, so what is ammo in particular? I told you it's a middleware. Uh, it, provi it provides the connectivity component and the data distribution component to applications. So when you uh, install an Android, who, who has an Android device? Let me ask you that. OK, everyone, basically. Uh, so when you install an application, it says, do you want this application to be able to access the internet? And then you say, yes, or no. I don't know why my uh, background screen picture wants to access the internet, whatever. So you do that, and you're like, oh, OK. Um, the problem is every single one of those programs has to de develop code to connect to the internet and synchronize. And so what Ammo does is say, why don't you just all synchronize with me, and I'll synchronize with the, the outside world. And so that really, I mean, how many people have really, really looked at code syn uh, data synchronization among multiple uh, devices with inconsistent connectivity, and I mean, lots, of, just imagine how complex, if every one of you had the exact same software on your phone, and you're all trying to synchronize it, and the wireless was going up and down, and it would just be a pain. So Ammo handles that for you, um, and it's nice, it works, it works really well. And uh, it also makes your code simpler, because you yourself don't have to program that code. You don't have to, you're just like, here, this is what I, this is going out to the world. Here's a data, datagram packet or blob of data. Go away, and you never have to deal with it again. Uh, yeah. um, so Ammo makes use of a code generator to um, generate what's called a content provider. It's basically a, a localized database with some public-facing API calls within the Android application that allows data to be shared between that application and other applications on the phone. But Ammo extends that to use that mechanism to distribute information publicly uh, through the Ammo system. Um, there's lots of rules and who sees what and things like that, but I'm not going to get into, into how that works. Uh, it makes use of the standard Android API uh, mechanisms of the content provider. And uh, personally, I think the content provider is amazing. So any of you download your music or um, your movies off of, legally, mind you, off of Amazon or something like that, you download your content, you don't really care. I mean, honestly, how many of us really, truly care where the file is sitting? We, I don't. I personally don't. I want it accessible. I want to be able to see it. I want it to be able to stream to whatever device I want. But I don't really care where the file lives. A content provider is the same idea. It, con it contains all of your information. It keeps track of where your, uh, your contacts are 
a content provider. So it keeps track of your data for your, con your contacts in your phone or your device. You don't really care where they're stored, you just want to be able to make sure they're usable. You want to be able to access it when you're sending an email or uh, add a new contact, delete a contact. You just wanted those simple interfaces to the information. You don't really care where on your device that information is stored. And so that's what's, I think, really nice about a content provider. And Android in general gives you that ability. It's one of its several major benefits over other platforms, in my opinion. But uh, unfortunately, content providers, well, Android in general, its biggest issue is it's not really well documented. There's not a lot of official recommended practices. Um, and that's a problem. Uh, so uh, these AMO applications, AMO handles the networking, they don't have to worry about that. Handles state synchronization, they don't have to worry about that. Uh, also, they don't have to add that permission to access the internet. So if you were using AMO on your personal device, you would be able to install an application and you would know, or you'd be able to write an application and say, here, I use AMO to connect to the internet. You know how that works. You can control that better than I, you, you can control where I really am going, not just give me carte blanche uh, access to the entire internet. So that's one nice thing. Um, Plus, as a developer, you don't have to write all that code, which is uh, nice. Um, state ink, well, let's see, state synchronization. What am I doing on time? OK. Uh, limitations, bandwidth, unknown server, connectivity, things like that. Because specifically, this is targeting handheld devices. And on, uh, everybody here always has internet c connectivity on their handheld device, right? I mean, this is. Um, oh yeah, so I covered, it, it reaches inside the content provider and pulls data out of it. Um, not really hugely significant, but that's how it works. And then it has multiple channels it can send data out on, so wireless, 3G, actually connect a cable to it, um, newer devices you can act as a USB host, things like that. Um, and it reads and writes to the content provider, and so your application just uses the normal content provider interfaces to read and write the information. Whoops. So, uh, like I said, Android has issues. Um, the code itself is fine, generally, in my opinion. It's good. The, uh, the idea behind Android, amazing. But not a whole lot of documentation and not a whole lot of uh, uh, example code for how to actually do these things because they'll say, here, use this little code for this part. Mm, excuse me. And they'll say, oh, here's this other little code snippet for this part, but it doesn't show you how to combine them. Oh, and there's this hidden thing you have to do in between that nobody ever mentions. So um, that's an issue. Um, and uh, one of the big things of Vanderbilt is uh, design patterns. It's one of their major research areas. Um, so um, anybody ever heard of the Gang of Four for design patterns? OK, much better than I expected, to be honest. But uh, uh, we have a lot of faculty who works in that field. And so design patterns are um, different than UI patterns and things like that. So design patterns are the simplest is the bridge. So you're bridging old code, or two different interfaces, two different APIs, adapting, there's an adapter, bridge. Um, there's a bunch of different basic components of how you do design. And so you, you tweak them to your exact needs, but these are concepts that generally people through experience have decided, hey, that's a really good idea. Oh, objects, those are probably good. Maybe we should include that in our uh, language. And so, Design patterns in a language, an older language, become uh, design features in a newer language. And so um, I've been working a lot on design patterns and things like that. Uh, so those are mixed in. I'm not really going to talk a lot about those. But if you're familiar with the concept, um, it really is nice. And if you're not, it really makes the code a lot easier to document 
uh, a lot easier to understand, and your code is logically a lot cleaner. Um, plus, uh, the paradigm of not having to actually do your synchronization is a lot different for people who are used to client-server uh, interactions. So, um, AMO in particular has to write that documentation on top of Android's uh, normal lack thereof. Let's see. Oh yeah, and uh, it's hard to optimize code that you're not writing yourself. So if you can optimize generated code, that's great because if you have 100 applications all using generated code, you find an optim optimization in that component, hey look, all 100 of your applications just got better. And there's actually a lot of examples of where that happens in middleware and uh, platforms, things like that. Um, Actually, Android 4.2, I think, was nothing but speed enhancements, um, where they found optimizations that they could do, maybe it was, I don't know, 4.1 or 4.2, one of the subdivisions. But it was nothing but uh, ways to improve the system. And so that's a good, another good example of where you, if you optimize code that everybody's using, it helps everybody. So uh, the new code generator, I've been working on, I've been calling it Druid as the acronym. Um, this actually generates an entire Android application, um, including lots of things that we might not generally make to start. <clears throat> and it uses uh, modeling grade computing concepts such as the model, uh, which we call a contract, and it generates the entire application based off of a specification. So. Uh, let's see. Um, the generator is designed for ammo and non-ammo projects. So you, literally you can design, uh, what I have on these applications has no ammo in them at all. They're just regular applications. And uh, it has a full, I have full working applications that I have pictures up uh, at the end. But um, the same APK works on tablets and phones. Um, and displays right in both. It's pretty impressive. Um, this is just a list of a bunch of courses. I've taken just tons of courses in this area. Um, I kind of just took them at random and they all just pointed towards this type of thing. So, um, uh, plus these, that slide in particular was from a course uh, presentation I was giving and I was like, yeah, they might be interested. Uh, so here's what it actually, the acronym. Develop rapid user interface designs. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it, it works for the name for right now. Because it generates a UI for you too. Uh, not a good UI. I'm not saying it's a good UI. And that, it's that way on purpose. And I'll get to why. Um, uh, so it's a code generator. And it generates the following things for you. At least some of them. Uh, content provider, it generates everything you need for the content provider. So database, everything, the code, uh, UI packages for every what's defined in the contract, and ORM, um, a custom ORM, which is generally a bad thing to do, but is really good in this case, because, and I'll show you why. And it implements a lot of your uh, unit testing. So everybody who has to write unit tests know they suck and you hate writing them, but this generates the skeletons for them for you. So um, it really is useful. Um, and in Android in particular, unit tests, unit testing components is non-trivial. So it does a lot of that hard work for you. Um, so yeah. Uh, Android in particular has a ton of ways to uh, do the same thing. So if you want to download a file, or let's say you just want to download an image off the internet and store it and display it. Like the combinations and permutations of ways you can do that is ridiculous. I'm, sh let's see. I haven't done the math to be honest, but at least two to 300 different combinations of ways of doing that with different cost benefits and implementation 
uh, exactness and different ways you can do it. So you can download through a service. You could download in a thread. You could download asynchronously through a service. You could download th synchronously. And then there's multiple ways of doing each one of those. And so as a new developer sitting down and developing, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. You don't know what to do. You don't know the best way to do it. And, oh, synchronous? Oh, that's fine. I'll use synchronous. I don't care. Oh, you don't realize why asynchrony is useful. Oh, your application's blocking. Oh, Android by design will kill your application after five seconds of uh, um, being blocked. Oh, you tested your system on uh, the server being right next to you. You never tested it over uh, cell phone connection. Hey, look, your uh, three meg file doesn't download within five seconds. Your application dies. Um, so. Knowing these, con if you're a new developer, these concepts aren't obvious to you initially, but they're not all. They're also not very well explained, and so that's a, an issue. And so Druid tries to get around this by implementing best practices, uh, and if nothing else, at least showing you and describing why we believe, or I believe at this point, these are best practices, um, because I've taken months and hours and days and oh this one's slightly better oh i and i've run benchmarks on these things and done a lot of ac actual academic research and saying this is better why just just trust me i don't want to explain it <laughs> um so uh i've mentioned content provider and here's how it actually works it has these five uh basic methods to it there's more but these are them these are the main ones. Uh, get type basically just gets you the metadata about what you're, you're grabbing. And the others are obvious, like if you're used to databases at all. Query, insert, update, and delete. I mean, those are just standard concepts. So query gets you a list of things or gets you an object you're querying for. Insert adds to the content provider. Update is an edit and updating the content and delete deletes an object or rows in a database or what however you actually design the back end of the content provider because content provider doesn't actually have to have a sqlite back end it can have flat file it can have uh, internet connectivity it can have lots of things uh, so issues with content provider uh, documentation is just horrible it just it really is um, you can find simple examples that say how to do simple things. Easy. They're all over. They're in books. But real good examples, I haven't found anywhere. I, I just haven't. Um, and that's a problem, in my opinion. Um, it, it doesn't give best practices on how to connect to the content provider. So a lot of times they'll say, oh, here's how you design your content provider. And they'll do a decent job. But they won't give you good ways of connecting to the content provider. Oh, maybe I should connect to this in a thread because, oh, it might block, and things like that. Um, oh, and this is just my favorite. The API for how to insert and the API how to get back don't agree. They're different mechanisms. So you can, I, I forget if it's insert. You can insert a short, but you can't read back a short. Um, or vice versa. Same with the byte array. You can read. Oh, you can read back a byte array, but there's no way of putting a byte array in the system. So um, there's convoluted ways of doing it, and that's just where it's at. And there's historical reasons why those two APIs for reading and inserting are different. Use different mechanisms. Um, <coughs> Yeah, easy to crash your application for unknown reasons to you at first if you don't realize the um, best practices. Uh, so how to solve these problems? First, you take a sip of water. But secondly, you generate more of the code f for the user, and you say, hey, this is what I recommend. And you don't stop them from using their, or editing that code. You're just like, here's a really good starting point. And uh, documentation in that gener uh, human readable generated code, by the way. Let me, let me state that. Because a lot of generated code just is horrible like to read. You just can't understand it. Mine, 
is structured like proper code, like indenting, tabbing. Um, yes, well, somewhat. As good as you can, I'll put it that way. Um, things like that. Um, so 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 as a variable name. No, I'm kidding. Um, let's see. Oh, and for the UI, uh, when I said I make a bad UI, I'm, I didn't, I actually make a really, really, really good UI, but it looks really plain and simple because I, first of all, am not artsy. And uh, I would be horrible at anything like UI driven. I, I like to sit in a corner and, and stare into the corner and think about how to design algorithms. That's, that's my field. Uh, that's what I like to do. That's probably not many people's here's idea of a fun time. I get that. I would hate to have to design a UI. That, some people love that. So I focus on where I am good at. And uh, Android in particular allows you to separate those uh, goals. So you have your system code here, and you have your UI code here. And Android makes the UI code most of the time XML uh, files. So what I do is um, I make the generated code have the proper XML files over here and um, proper lo localization files. So all of the strings that are in the uh, the UI are actually stored in a separate strings file. So you could say, oh, well, here's my strings.xml, and give this to your translator, have him translate every single word in there. Your UI guy doesn't have to care about, oh, what's the right term to use, or whatever. They, well, they might have to go through and make sure words aren't different lengths and stuff like that. But So you have your programmer here, your UI developer here, your translator over here. It allows you to separate out concerns a lot better than if you just hard-coded all your UI into actual Java code or something like that. And that's something Android's promoted from the beginning. And uh, <clears throat> basically, uh, the more generated code you write, uh, my goal is to make it hard for bad programmers to write bad code, which, oh, they will still do, but... Um, Okay, so what all does Druid do? It implements a full CRUD application, so create, read, update, and delete uh, application skeleton. Um, it also generates the testing framework to test all the pieces that I generate. Um, so it not actually doesn't actually test them, but tests. It makes a framework for you to write the code to test them, and some of the parts itself tests or could write. I don't haven't actually gotten to that part yet but we will get to that. Um, uh, so the RM stuff, I'll actually get to. Um, it works pretty nice. I, I actually am really, really loving that part of what I wrote. It makes things so much easier. Um, the UI package, um, I'll describe. Content provider is optimized, and so you don't have to write, worry about it, and ammo stuff you don't have to worry about. So or, ORM, object relational mapping. It's a technique that's been around for a long time. It allows you to translate between two different uh, unlike types. Um, but it's difficult to do at scale for complex things because, um, well, here's an example, first of all, actually. So here's a XML definition of a, we'll call it an object, a location. It has GUID, lat long, whatnot. So here's the Java class that would translate from that. But uh, the issue with ORM, or, uh, databases don't have inheritance. They don't have classes. They don't have polymorphism. So all these ideas of what you want your class to do can't be easily translatable to a database. So I don't do that. Uh, and here's another issue. SQLite, uh, version 3 at least, I'm not sure about the others, has uh, Integer, blob, real. And those are your, I think that's it. Yeah, but anyways, integer, blob, and real, and I think there's a couple others. But uh, it doesn't have a way of storing Boolean values, um, which, so 
you would have to manually create the logic of saying, oh, this is a one, this is a zero, change it, do all these other things. Code generator does that for you. So you can just say, I want to store a Boolean, and it handles the mechanism to do that. Also, short, int, long, byte, it, it translates those for you. Um, how to solve this? Code generation. Uh, generate the conversion methods and the container classes. So if you start from the database and go out, you can actually really easily use ORM. But um, big ORM libraries and packages don't want to do that because it's not really, doesn't actually fit like the commercial model, I would say, and doesn't actually fit like, oh, we can do everything. And well, I don't care if it does everything, I just want it to work for what I'm doing. So that's what I've done. Um, and the other thing is you have to limit the types that they can input. And so right now, the types that you can input into the system are the Java native types. So int, long, float, double, uh, boolean, and string. Um, and to be honest, most data that any of us would write, uh, blob to, uh, most anything any of us would write, that's really all we would need. Um, you, or you could compose the data that you want to store out of those. So I think that's a good starting point, and in the future it's actually going to be expandable, but right now that's where it, it <coughs> excuse me, that's what it, that's what it does. So uh, easily convert um, from the contract to the database and then to the Java code. That's the point of ORM. And uh, it works really well, surprisingly. I, I was just experimenting with it to start with, actually. And it worked so well, I was like, OK, I'm going to use this. And I've never written anything else without it now, because it just makes um, life so much easier. Um, here's an example of the, con uh, the model I was talking about. It's really not complex. So uh, version, mode, you can ignore the mode. But So uh, relation. So if you're familiar with a SQL or an object, th or that would be a table or that would be a, a, a class. That's your type of data you're going to store. Next one, I'll show you the fields. So I want to store a text field, and it's going to be named a text field. And it'll have a default and down the list. So you, you, you make this XML file up, and you say, this is the type of data I want to store in my application, and then I want to be able to uh, tr translate or uh, transmit over the network and whatnot. And so here's where you define all your fields. And uh, here's some keys. Um, these actually aren't really significant at the moment, but they will be. The one that isn't significant is this UI list view row layout. Um, I'll get back to that, but that is the only one that's really used right now. But messages. So you want to be able to uh, send, the, transmit the data over the network. Well, some, you don't want to always send the same huge thing all the time. Maybe you just want to send, here's the main thing the first time, and then here's updates to it that are much smaller. And here's an example of that. We call them messages. So here's your full update, and then terse just means a small, like when you bit, uh, actual bits matter, you would send terse. So when actual bits matter, here, only send the text and along. Those are the only actual things that need to absolutely be updated. And uh, um, if you notice, there's an encoding for protobuf. Um, another type of en data encoding, JSON, things that we're going to uh, hopefully support in the future. So you can encode your message in a certain type. Um, different encodings have different cost benefits to them. So you'll be able to choose that. And so you'll be able to send that, uh, it'll send that message in that encoding. And so you could send it to your server with the proper encoding that you want, things like that. Um, Here's uh, just a picture of the Eclipse project. It creates, you literally, all you do is you make a folder called contract, plop in your contract into that folder, run the uh, code generator Druid, 
and it makes all of this for you. It makes your, well, you don't even need the folder for contract, but you, it generates all of these files for you. So three main packages, the ORM, the provider, and the UI. So the provider stores your database, all of that stuff. The ORM handles all of the uh, difficult, thing, difficult part of storing data into the content provider. Um, so all you do is you, you create a Java object, you update your Java single object with whatever the data you want to use or store, and you say dot store, done. There's nothing else you have to do or update or whatever. That's one of the mechanisms we're looking into, and there's other ways, but it's really nice. And so you don't have to, uh, otherwise you would literally have to write SQL code in your code to update the SQL database, and it's just, it's ugly. Um, and so here's all, uh, I was talking about localization earlier and how you can separate out the different files for UI and um, the translation of all the strings and the layouts for all the files. It generates all of these. And if you see table one creation fragment, table one edit fragment, table one list uh, custom row view, um, semi-reasonably human readable. There's still code generated names, but semi-reasonable human readability. Um, plus doing it this way allows us to um, make a, a single APK that's usable on tablets and phones that actually has a different UI for each one. So on the phone, it has the single fragment, which I'll get to in a second, single fragment displayed at once. On the, ta on the tablets, it has them side by side when you have the device horizontal. So it, it allows nicer, and it, and it gives you that code so you can see how that works and use that in your project. Um, here's the code for how the layout looks. Oh, look, I just have one thing in the center. Well, simple. Um, here's the layout for that thing that goes in the center. So it has buttons, it has a list view, and if, uh, let's see. Ah, here it is. List view down the right-hand side. Uh, the list view, uh, when I told you about that, that key that was important, you were defining what things you wanted to see listed. Um, that actually is, defines what row, what, when you're seeing a row of content, it'll tell you what fields you want to see. So it's kind of cool. Uh, here's an a, a excerpt of the strings file. So like I said, semi-human -read, readable, so it at least tells you what it is. Table one, view label, and it tells you the label of the, the field you're looking at, a text field, whatnot. Um, here's an image. Um, I made it teal just so you could see it. Um, otherwise, it doesn't display well on projector for some reason. Um, it has the bold number is a unique identifier for each uh, a row in a database, but each object you updated into the database. And so uh, the four rows there are a string, an int, a float, and uh, a short, I think. But um, so you could customize what are listed in your list view here, what actual data you want to see. And so this is just an XML file. You now say, oh, here's this ugly thing. It has the data I want. It works functionally. I want to send it off to the UI department, make it look nice. So once all the data is there, you as a programmer say, I don't care how it looks. I just want it to work. Once it works, the artsy guy will handle, or artsy girl will handle how it looks. And so that's why I purposely don't care about how the UI looks to start. That's another step in the process or another person's um, issue. And so here's a, a, an example. It just stores all the different types that um, it handles right now. And here's how you would view. Um, this is the fragment for viewing um, the relation whatever you're storing. So it handles shorts, booleans, it shows as false. <coughs> Here's how you enter them. Um, it actually uh, changes the enter type. So text allows you to enter text, numbers, you know, 
can only enter numbers. Float and uh, double allows you to enter decimal numbers, things like that. Uh, I'll probably eventually get hex and phone numbers and things like that as basic data types, but for right now, they're just text. And uh, Boolean is obviously here a, a toggle button. Um, so it automatically switches the input type that's displayed based on what the data type that's being stored is. And so here's an example of the tablet UI I was talking about. The left-hand side is always constant, that list view. And on the right-hand side, it changes between the create, edit, uh, um, and view, or delete, too. It's just a button. Um, here's some sources. Uh, down at the bottom is the modeling area computing links. If you're interested at all, there's a bunch of content there. GME is a project they work on. Uh, um, there's a bunch of stuff there um, you can be interested in. So, uh, any questions, <clears throat> comments, concerns? Want to throw money at me? What? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, actually, uh, so that contract I showed you was XML uh, design, and that's actually uh, mathematical based. It's uh, but not the normal mathematics you think of. So it has a hierarchy to it, um, and it has data types. You can actually convert that to a uh, um, different re data representations, and that's the math part that I was talking about. That's why I was like, don't worry, it's, yes, it's math, but not the math you're thinking about. It's a, uh, so like data sets and um, set theory and things like that. So that. It's a type, it's a different way of looking at math, and so you can take your XML and you can convert it to, um, there's some languages where there's an XML format um, there's a different, there's a third format, there's a fourth format, and they're all interchangeable. The conversion from one language display format to another is a mathematical function. Like, you don't think of it that way, but, like, like by definition, it actually is a math function. So, it's actually the conversion of the template to the generated code is a math function. It's kind of theoretical and... <clears throat> a little weird, but that's that's why I was like, don't worry, it's not the math that people think they hate for some odd reason. In third grade, they didn't like long division, but um, so it's a higher level math that really you don't even have to worry about it because if you uh, and so the fact is, if I prove my code works or my generator works for all the basic data types, if you try 400 strings in your relation, your contract. I know it's going to work because it worked mathematically with a, three strings, so it's just extending it. It's just a way of verifying logically that the code will work. Uh, oh, this will be, uh, yeah, but there you go. Uh, are you familiar with DDS? No. Okay, D uh, distributed data system. It's same idea, sort of. Um, but DDS is more on airplanes. So how airplanes travel data through the system. Um, ships, m uh, military vehicles. That's how they work. Um, it's... Uh, so it's just the messaging system. It, it, it works, though. It, it's kind of interesting and cool. Um, but this, really, the code generator, I made it more for just regular applications. And it also helps ammo. So the ammo parts you wouldn't use in your application. You could, but you then would only be able to install on devices with ammo. And currently, there are none public. So have fun with that install base. Um, 
Any other questions? It's on GitHub. Uh, I don't recommend you use it because uh, it, as far as I know, there's two people who can get it to work right now. I'm working on designing a better, um, it, it all works, it works, but it's ugly, ugly, ugly how you have to massage it into working. And so it's going to be a Maven plugin. Uh, if you're not familiar, Maven's like Make. It's a code and system and resource management system. And so I'm going to actually be making it a command line <coughs> function. And so you can just say, run the command line. Here's this. I want it to, I want it to give me instructions. I want it to give me a default uh, contract file. I want it to make me a default project. And, It'll just go and split out, uh, spit out all the information you need, spit out the files, and let you go at it. That's not now. So, um, but yeah, it's uh, I don't have the link up there. But yeah, it's on it's on if you search Druid, it's on GitHub. But it's not really. Plus, uh, if, uh, all the code generations using string template, which in and of itself is not fun. So. Uh, it's there, and, but it's not really publicly usable yet. It, I ho I'm hoping to change that here soon, but uh, another question? No? Okay. Thank you very much.